spread of mud cow disease. Now these two conformation and configuration, uh, this brings about some confusion. The terms configuration, conformation are often confused. Configuration refers to geometric relationship between a given set of atoms, for example, L and D amino acids, or L and D glucose. Huh? Interconversion of the configuration Configurational alter alternatives requires breaking and reforming of covalent bonds. Conformation it refers to the spatial relationship, the way they are put in space of every atom in a molecule. Interconversion between conformers occurs with Retention of configuration generally via rotation about single bonds. So these two are not the same. Conformation is a spatial, no? where they are placed in space. Okay. Proteins were initially classified by their growth characteristics. Okay, in our organic chemistry before, no, we usually just say fibrous protein and globular protein. So fibrous protein, you know, they are like fibers. Very good example is collagen or your skeletal muscles. It's some sort of fibrous. But your globular proteins, no, like your hemoglobin, like your enzymes, they are globular. No. Okay, so gross characteristic. Now the four orders of protein structure, we have primary, the one that is mentioned already, the uh, amino acids joined together by peptide linkages. You may have as few amino acids, like three amino acids. The good example is glutathione, or a protein which may have several thousands amino acids involved. Okay. That is the primary structure. Now, next is we have the secondary structure. The folding of short, about 30 to 30 amino acids involved, or what we call three or 30 residues. Contiguous segments of polypeptides into geometrically ordered. No? Okay, here we have this for the secondary structure. We have first one, alpha helix. Now alpha helix, I don't know what is a helix. So there is a right turn helix or a left torn helix. So this is this uh, straight rod here. This one is the axis. That's the axis where your uh, string of primary structure amino acids are wound out over it. And so you will notice there you have carbon to carbon, carbon to nitrogen, carbon to carbon and the side chains are not uh, shown, or what you call the R group. So if we look at this with the R group, 
and we put uh, we look it up from the top. There you are. So you're looking it up from the top. Okay. And all of these are here are the R groups. Okay. But not R group, not all R groups are outside. Now the R groups that are shown here are those R groups found in aqueous solution. So the R groups that do not like the aqueous solution or the water, they are usually the R groups are found inside in here. Do you get the idea? No. If this is a cytosolic protein, a protein here, where there is water all around. So you can see that these are groups are of are hydrophilic R groups or water soluble. Now let's go back to this one. Okay, so it looks like a spring, no? It looks like a spring. And so that to stabilize that, that you will not stretch out this the, the spring or compress the spring, then this is stabilized by hydrogen bonds. The hydrogen bonds will be formed by this carbon to nitrogen and the hydrogen bond here bonds to this carbon to nitrogen, carbon to nitrogen. And this carbon to, uh, this carbon to nitrogen down below. Kasinsitibo ko din niya. Muluksom na yun. Okay, so you have here uh, hydrogen bonding, <coughs> hydrogen bondings, so that these loops here cannot be stretched out or cannot be compressed. Now, if we put all the other atoms like that now, so you can easily guess. You can easily guess that these are your hydrogen bonds, this dotted or interrupted one here, that one there, that one, formed by hydrogen and oxygen. Okay, so you have so many. Although this is a weak bond, compared to covalent bonds, because there are so many of them, then it can be strong. Just like when you are going to, to tie your two fingers with a string, uh, a thread, a thread, that can easily be broken. But if you have so many threads wound over it, you cannot easily break it with your two fingers. And this is here uh, because of the number of hydrogen bonds. This <laughs> structure is uh, stabilized. So that's the alpha helix. So the next structure that you can see in the secondary structure is the beta. 
ship. Now, this alpha and beta has nothing to do with alpha carbon or beta carbon now. Alpha means it was first discovered. And the second to be discovered is the sheet. So we call the beta sheet. So the first is the helix. We call it alpha helix. And the second that is being discovered, the sheet, they call it the beta sheet. Okay. All right, let's look at how these beta sheets are. Hmm. Okay. So you have here hydrogen bonds, hydrogen bonds, hydrogen bonds, hydrogen bonds, hydrogen bonds. This is a polypeptide chain. This is another polypeptide chain. Another polypeptide chain. So we have the arrows there shows the direction. So you have here one polypeptide chain going that way. And you have another polypeptide chain going this way. And this one is going that way. So if it is so, this could only be, let's say, this could be three different polypeptide chain in different directions, or one polypeptide chain going that way, and then it turns around this way, and then it turns around that way. Now, the next illustration down below is that all the polypeptide chain is going one direction. So if that is so, this polypeptide chain is a different polypeptide chain or is different from that. Okay. So you may have three polypeptide chain in uh, different, and they are in one direction going, going in one direction. And they are held together by hydrogen bonds, hydrogen bonds, many of them. However, now let's look. However, if this amino acid is negatively charged, here, if this amino acid is negatively charged and this amino acid is positively charged, then they can form a salt band. No? So these two would be nearer each other. So that would change uh, how this would look. Or Example, this is a hydrophobic amino acid. And this is also a hydrophobic amino acid. And these are placed in water. So they do not like the water, the two. So they tend to get closer to each other, pulling the whole thing there. And this one, pulling the whole thing down. So they will meet. You see this now? So. We mentioned already your hydrophobic, you have your hydrogen bonds or your salt bonds. Okay, so we have here two examples of uh, enzymes. You have different this left and this one here on this left side this one is uh, an isomerase this is an enzyme triose phosphate isomerase 
Okay, complex with two substrate analog, two phosphoglycerate in red. Alternating, no, not a phosphoglycerate, red and the red one, that one. And the gray one here. Alternating beta sheet. Okay. And we have helix, the green ones. So this one here in coil like a spring, ah, coil, that one, coil. And then you have a uh, beta barrel core surrounded by helices. Mm. That's the beta and the helix is there. This green one here, helix. The right one is the lysozyme complex with the substrate analog. So the substrate is there, it's bound already, the red one. Substrate is the compound that is acted upon by the enzyme. So the lysozyme here has already a substrate bound to the enzyme. Okay. So what you have, we have a helix, you have primary lung, oh. helix, uh, no. then primary, then you have a primary, just a string. So it is not so complex, lysozyme. All right. <clears throat> Loops and bins. So aside from alpha helix and beta pleated sheet, we also have uh, loops and bins. So when you say bin, that is a, a space that is very, very small. So you can be very sure that it is occupied by a small amino acid. And what are the small amino acid? Glycine. Sometimes alanine, because alanine is, is small. Huh? Usually found there at the torn and the bends. You have small amino acids. All right, the term tertiary structure refers to the entire three-dimensional conformation of a polypeptide. It indicates the three-dimensional space, how secondary structural features like helices, the beta sheets, the bands, the torns, and the loops. So that's tertiary. So a protein, could be only a primary structure, just only a string. Oh, just like when you say glutathione, glutathione is made up only of three amino acids. So it's just a string, so it's the primary structure. So secondary now becomes more complex because it can form helices sheets, beta sheets, and bends and loops. So a symbol to form domains, and these domains are specially uh, uh, different from another. So a domain is a section of routine structure sufficient to perform a particular chemical or physical tasks, such as binding, 
no? A substrate. Binding. So most domains are modular in nature. That is in both primary sequence and three-dimensional space. Such as those seen in uh, the lysozyme, the triose phosphate isomerases we have uh, seen, no? what you have seen. Okay. Now we have different. So, So you will notice that a co coenzyme or a cofactor, like for example, this one here, this red one, uh, NADH, nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. No. <clears throat> NADH, this is NAD with the hydrogen already. That means this is a reduced NAD. This is a coenzyme. So this coenzyme helps the activity of the enzyme, but this is reduced here. So that's the one there. The oxidized form of NAD is without an edge. And the blue one, the pyruvate, there. that is bound. So this is lactate dehydrogenase, which acts on the pyruvate. The right side we have here a catalytic subunit of a protein kinase. Catalytic subunit in this area. And so you have here a substrate analog ADP, adenosine diphosphate. And a peptide in purple ribbon, this one. Which also bound. Okay, we will be seeing this in our uh, kinetics of, of enzyme. So, a protein could be only one mer, meaning only one polypeptide or one peptide, we call it monomeric. If there are two peptide chain or polypeptide chain, it can become known as dimeric protein. No? Then we have, we have trimeric or tetrameric. Okay. Now, when we say dimeric, it does not tell us whether the two polypeptides are the same. 
it could be two different polypeptides. But when you say homodimers, the polypeptides there are the same. They are the same. Okay? And if they are not the same, no, we call it heterodimer. Heterodimer. Like for example, in hemoglobin, the protein portion there is globin. There are two kinds of subunits or polypeptides, alpha and beta. But there are two alphas and two betas. So two dimer, homodimer of alpha and two homodimer of beta. Since there are four subunits, it is called tetramer. You get it? Yeah. Oh. For example, this one, two alphas, alpha two, beta two. So that is homodimers, no? And then there's another one, a gamma. So that means there are five subunits here, five subunits of three different types. Alpha, beta, and gamma. So there is only one gamma. There are two betas. There are two alphas. So there are five subunits. You get it? Huh? Multiple structure stabilize tertiary and quaternary structure. Okay. Again, this, the bonds here, aside from your uh, the two covalent bonds, peptide bond and disulfide bond, the other bonds are non-covalent. You have hydrogen bonds, hydrophobic bonds, and salt bonds. And of course, you can include a very weak bond, van der Waals. Okay? So higher order of protein structure is stabilized primarily, exclusively, no, stab they are stabilized aside from the, the structure already formed by the peptide bond and the disulfide bond, which are covalent. So, the way they are stabilized so that they will not be uh, moving around. So you have so many of your hydrogen bonds, so many of hydrophobic bonds, and so many of your salt bonds. Okay, so you see this. Hydrogen bonds, salt bridges, carboxyl and uh, carboxyl of aspartic and glutamic and then protonated lysyl, arginyl, and histidyl residues. These interactions are individually weak. One to five kilocalories per mole relative to 80 to 120 kilocalories per mole for a covalent bond. So what are those two covalent bonds? Peptide bond and Another one is your disulfide band or sulfur to sulfur band. So they are weak bands. So they are analogous to the Velcro fastener. You notice your Velcro fastener, you have hooks there. No? If there is only one hook, 
it's very, very weak. But there are so many of them, it becomes very strong. Your velcro, fastener. Okay. Oh, here's the one, the disulfide band that I mentioned. Huh? This one are usually formed by amino acids that contain sulfur, like cysteine. Huh? So this is usually seen by cysteine, the SH group of cysteine. Okay. Biophysical techniques reveal three-dimensional structure. Now we, we will not be doing this. No? Uh, laboratory is very hard to do no? uh, in the situation that we have now. We cannot have a face-to-face -face, uh, lecture so how much more if you do laboratory works? And in the second place, we do not have such machines. We do not have an electron microscope or cryo electron microscope or an M NMR, X-ray crystallography. Well, molecular modeling, you can have your ball, ball and sticks. Huh? Okay. So this is just tell you that when you do research on proteins, if you become researcher, by the way, researchers are poorly paid. I don't know now. But uh, before, I spent my, my time in the laboratory, <laughs> I was poorly paid. <laughs> I thought research can, <laughs> can hit you a jackpot. <laughs> All right, so these are the biophysical techniques that you are going to do if you want to study on proteins. Oh. Okay. You are not treating patients, you are just studying. Okay, protein folding. So we mentioned already how a protein is going to uh, form its shape or structure as a result of those uh, uh, you don't, they, they remember your, the one I mentioned is the hydrophobic bonding. No, it is an uncovalent one, but it, it, be, it is really a very strong or positive uh, way by which a protein is being folded. Now, aside from that, there are what we call chaperone proteins which assist the protein to fold. It's very important uh, protein because if a protein is not properly folded into its native conformation, no, then you have problems with that particular protein and it may give you some disorder or a disease. Perturbation of protein conformation may have pathologic consequence. So you have prions. Okay. Prion proteins. You have Alzheimer's disease. You have beta thalassemias. Beta thalassemias, this is a problem of your hemoglobin where your beta, your beta subunit, have a genetic disorder. So, as a 
an oxygen carrier, your hemoglobin, it does not work. So if you have beta, so many beta thalassemias in your blood, your carrying or your oxygenation of your tissues would be impaired. This beta thalassemias. Collagen illustrates the role of post-translational processing and protein maturation. Protein maturation often involves making and breaking of covalent bonds. All right. Collagen is a fibrous protein. Collagen forms unique triple helix. You're already a single helix. Okay. So this is the sequence of amino acids. Glycine, you see that? Glycine and glycine. Then you have X and Y, X and Y, or other amino acids. But mostly those amino acids are proline and lysine. What did we say about proline and lysine? It can be hydroxylated. So you have an OH, you have an OH, you have an OH there if these are all, uh, these are all occupied by proline and lysine there. Uh, and so you have it here, the primary, your helix. And this helix would require three other helix. And these three helix are wound together. <coughs> and we have <laughs> class. And we have this triple helix. Huh? Okay. <coughs> the triple helix. So that makes your uh, collagen now very strong because as we said, this hydroxylated proline and lysine here will form hydrogen bonds all over. There. So this becomes a strong protein material. And these are found no, in all organs, especially your skin and the blood vessel. And Oh. And the blood vessels here, if you have weak uh, triple helix in your blood vessels of your collagen molecule, that blood vessel is weak. And that can go into atherosclerosis because if it is weak, it is, it usually has some tears or some eroded surfaces inside the blood vessel. And you know, when the blood vessel inside, you now the inside of the blood vessel is not smooth, what's going to happen would be, there will be a, uh, an area or a needles or a nest where a plaque can be formed. So you will be forming atherosclerotic plaques. Now this occurs in your arteries because the artery is always under stress. Why are the arteries under stress? Any idea? Try to feel your pulse in your wrist. Try to feel it. Huh? What did you feel? A pulse. A pulse. 
Where did that pulse come from? The artery. Huh? Where did it come from? Why, why do you have the pulse? Because of the contraction of the heart. All right. So there you are. How many times the heart contracts in one day? You have any idea? One day, Doc. Huh? One day. How many contractions of the heart average in a normal heart every day? One hundred thousand. Ah, okay, that's about around that number. Hundred thousand. Okay. So every time the heart contracts, the blood vessels artery expands. Correct. That's how you feel your pulse. Now, how old are you now? You are in your 20s, so that's 20 years. Your arteries are having that kind of stress. And if the major protein that is found in your arteries, a collagen, is weak, what's going to happen? It will collapse. Huh? It will rupture. <laughs> rupture. There, there, is, there is rupturing, but it will not rupture through all throughout. So there might be cracks. And you know that the inside of your blood vessel, or the lumen of your blood vessel, should be very, very smooth. Because if there is any roughness, your platelet will break. And what happens when the platelet breaks? What happens? Huh? Bleeding. No. How can you bleed? How can you bleed? Inside Pamanas blood vessel, what paman ma putol ang blood vessel? What happens if there is a break in the inside only? Accumulate. Awa na, nakalimta na ang ilahang uh, blood clotting mechanism. Sclerosis. Uh, Your platelets, once it breaks, okay. then it initiates blood clotting. Oh. Huh? Diba? But this is prevented. Once there are cracks or roughness, Macrophages try to pave and make it smooth again. And it is using cholesterol. You know, cholesterol is smooth. No? It is just like when you have a strip, there are plenty of back holes there. And so, the Department of <clears throat> Public Works is going to pave that with asphalt, diba? To make it smooth. That's the same thing that's going on. The repair there is smooth, to smooth in it. Because once you have a clot inside your blood vessel, uh, that is the end. Because that clot might travel and go somewhere else and become a blood or a thrombus so that blood cannot pass through. And if it happens in your brain with a very, very minute or very, very small blood vessels there, once it is lodged there, then you will have a stroke. If it, it happens also in your heart, you have also a stroke. Huh? Cardiac stroke and brain stroke. 
See? So, did blood vessel itself tries to correct it. The macrophages comes around, no? utilizing cholesterol from your LDL. Remember your LDL? Low density lipoprotein, carrier of cholesterol. And so it oxidizes the cholesterol, use it to smooth the area. And so that particular portion grows. But then cholesterol, although it is smooth, it is sticky. So the blood elements, what are the blood elements? Red blood cell, white blood cells. No, it sticks there. So it becomes rough again. So they put another layer of oxidized cholesterol. So what happens to the lumen? It becomes smaller and smaller. And if the lumen becomes smaller, the blood that is passing through will have a hard time. And yet the, the heart tries to compensate by pumping hard so that the blood can pass through. And what you will get would be hypertension. Diba? Yeah, ginaman mo na, diba? Kinsa may manars din na, kinsa may mga... <laughs> Say PT niya. <laughs> okay? So, it started with a weak collagen in the blood vessel. How do we make that strong? To increase hydrogen bonding of the triple helix of the collagen. And you are going to use the enzyme hydroxylase. For proline, you call it prolyl hydroxylase. For lysine, you call it lysyl hydroxylase. And these enzymes does not work in the absence of vitamin C, ascorbic acid. That is why when you have deficiency of vitamin C, you have what we call scurvy. And scurvy is the disease of the collagen. Now, if you have atherosclerosis, that is a scurvy that is present in the blood vessel. And so I'll call it localized scurvy in the blood vessel, atherosclerosis. Did you get it? So how important is your collagen? And not only blood vessels, your bones are very important. Without a strong collagen, the bone will not be strong. It will be pliant. And again, vitamin C is needed. So, again, karun COVID, vitamin C. <laughs> okay. Uh, collagen is synthesized as a larger precursor. Nutritional and genetic disorders can impair collagen. So you see, nutritional and genetic. So what is collagen made up of? Amino acids. So if the amino acids, especially proline and lysine, are not there or deficient, it comes to the same. Even if you have hydroxylases, working in the presence of vitamin C, but your, but your amino acid, lysine and proline are lacking. So you still have come up, you still come up with a very weak, very, very weak collagen. Okay. 
I have now an idea. All right, let's have enzymes next time, kinetics. Uh, mechanism, regulation, and role of transition metals. This is section two. Proteins, myoglobins, we will talk about this. And then, uh, what is next? Our protein will come up with oil. Well, Anna. Uh, we will talk about enzymes. So we will be talking about uh, myoglobin and hemoglobin. That is active proteins. And then enzymes, another active protein. Okay. All right. Let's call it a day. Good luck. Okay.